I'm proud of my little Lavinish church because they believe in something called progressive revelation. If I understand that heavy-duty term, I think what it means is there's still more for us to learn about God. I'm proud of my little Seventh Avenue Church because I believe they are trying to learn every day that God's love dawns on us afresh every day. I'm proud of my little Avenue Church because they do believe in prayer and they do encourage prayer and they realize that the Bible is correct. We need to confess when we mess up and that's quite regularly for us. They've also encouraged us in the church and Sabbath after Sabbath, and you've grown up with it, to take time alone at the beginning of the day. And the one I struggle with the most in my own personality is the word solitude. Solitude. That means sit down in the common vernacular and shut up. The Bible would say, be still. And do not let your mind go empty as you focus on the light bulb, but focus on the life of Christ, the gospel of Christ, the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the second coming. And that is a discipline. That does not come naturally to us. And there will never be time to pray. We must make time. I'm talking to myself. You can listen if you want. And I believe... My church has taught me to worship. Now, I hate to be honest with you, but that's okay. There are times when I come to worship, I'm not ready for worship. Sometimes perhaps the preacher isn't even ready for worship. That's why I bring God's Bible with me to worship. Because if the pastor ever strays a little bit, open the Bible, of course, to the correct book, Philippians and read a little bit, you can multitask. And when he or she comes back on, then put the Bible down and keep listening. But don't ever treat church like a, okay, I got the popcorn, I got the binoculars, I hope worship is good. You prepare yourself for worship before you get to worship. I'm talking to myself, thanks for listening. And the one my church is learning more and more and I've been around for a few years, is to enjoy God. To enjoy God. That's biblical, man. And there's something called reverent joy. I used to tell my deacons every time when they start walking down the center aisle at communion time, hey, guys, it's not a funeral. It's a celebration. There was even a time in my church when that word scared us, celebration. You know nothing about that, kids. And I would suggest to you as has already been said so clearly. You can't just sit there. Do you know that some people find Christ when they actually go out to serve, and then they find Christ? Do you know other people find Christ when they look and sing some words, they don't even know what they mean, they actually find it because words can affect our thinking, duh. But the part that maybe scares my little church a little bit is that word that I started with, progressive revelation. Because basically an institution always wants to keep everything nice and smooth. But if there are more things to learn about God, when I present something to you or someone does, the first thing you're gonna do is, the first thing I do is, if I hear a sermon that agrees with what I already believe, I say, that's a good sermon. If I read a book that I already believe, I say, that's a good book. Well, then how does anybody get a new concept? And I would suggest to you that the little Christian Seventh-day Adventist church that I belong to also believes that the Spirit leads us in new revelation. Relax, I'm not gonna bring some new truth to you right now. But I and several others are doing this, and I hope you are too. We're trying to learn more and more about the character of God. It's not a buzzword. It's what I say every day. God, reveal yourself to me. 
What a relief. I don't have to be like you. You don't have to be like me. That's okay. We're all unique. We're all flaky. We're all weird. We all have a limp. We all stutter. And here's the clip I want you to watch because I think you're going to see the gospel if you listen carefully in this stutterer. Don't you tell me there aren't holy moments in secular occasions. And don't you ever say, you just can't do it. In case you didn't know, life is not fair. In case you didn't know, we're involved in a great controversy. One of the most impressive lines to me in there was when he said, The person I used to be, I would never talk to the person I am now. And the picture he gives of his girlfriend is a picture of God supporting, cheering, loving him unconditionally, listening to him while he tries to say something to her. And I would suggest to you that fellow earthlings, we, by the power of God, give each other pictures of God. Don't go out into the world and change the world. Go out into the world and may God pour his love into you and then you let his love flow through others. How did he get hit? A hard grounder, maybe a bad hop. Things happen. And the new revelation that I'm receiving in my life as I grow older is that Some of the cliches I used to say and I still hear by people I love, I don't agree with anymore. I don't try to change them. One of my prayers is, God, may I not be judgmental of judgmental people. But poor God. Some would say from this story, and they mean it sincerely, because this is what they tell me by the graveside. Pastor, there's a reason for everything. As if God is dishing out situations so people can end up with a stutter or cancer or heart attack or tragedy. Please, it's not biblical. Everything does not come from God. There is not a reason for everything except that we are born on the wrong planet. The bumper sticker's right. Things happen and God has nothing to do with it. How do I know that's biblical? Don't take any preacher's word. The first one is Hebrews 1, and it says this. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets in many times and various ways. But in these last days, see, the author thought Jesus was coming his day. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, through whom... He appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. Here's the kicker. The sun is the radiance of God's glory. What's radiance mean? Put on your shades. It's bright. Jesus is the clearest picture of God. And Jesus said this throughout his life. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and my Father are one. You with me? That's the first verse. And so when I look at some of the stories in the Old Testament, I don't rip out the Old Testament. When I read three different things in Exodus, one says, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Another one says, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Another one says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. I don't rip out Exodus. I just put that picture of God up on a a shelf here, and I run over to this shelf. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Show me one time where Jesus went up to the woman at the well and said, boom, may your heart be hardened. There's another verse that says, God sent an evil spirit to Saul. I don't rip out that part. I still believe in King Saul. But I go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and show me where Jesus ever sent an evil spirit to someone. Boom. In the Old Testament, 
God appears to be the cause of everything. In the New Testament, Jesus does not go around and say, have cancer, have a heart attack, be crippled, be blind, die. In the New Testament, Jesus says, walk, see, hear. Lazarus, he didn't say come down, he didn't say come up, he said come out. We're talking about that tomorrow. Listen, poor God. The reason why we do it, little earthlings, is because we want to make sense of everything that happens. In case you hadn't heard, living on this earth is nonsense. And one day, as I said to that teenager I told you about, Jesus is coming back. It's not symbolic. It's not, it's literal. As surely as you're looking at this good looking guy, as you're looking at me right here, (laughs) he's coming back. And the Bible says we start to go up. And I know what my dad is going to say when God comes back and the loved ones you've lost. Here's what my dad and your loved ones are going to say. My dad's going to say to me, I made it to the resurrection and I didn't die. Dad, you died. I didn't like it. Now we're supposed to go up. Let's go. A power outside of it. Let's go. The next verse I want to share with you is Jeremiah. You were brought up with this memory verse. Let me read it for the millionth time. For I know... The plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you'll call upon me and come and pray to me and I'll listen to you and you'll seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. I believe that verse. And the next one. I love the story. I already talked to you about the blind guy. Remember where Jesus spit in his eye? Okay, remember that? But listen to what the disciples said when they first saw the blind guy. They were just Old Testament personified. Listen. As he went along, he saw, this is John 9. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus, was sin what caused this problem? Now look what Jesus says. And if you take Jesus literally here, you've got an issue too because look what he says according to this one. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. Jesus, are you saying there are three people on the earth that did not sin? No. Jesus is saying his parents nor this kid as he was being born was the cause for his blindness. Look what Jesus says. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so the work of God might be displayed in his life. That does not mean God wanted him blind for 50 years. So No, it means just watch. And then Jesus heals him. I love that one. You know, we have a lot of tornadoes down in Tennessee. And a lot of strange theology comes out after the tornadoes have come and gone. I go to visit some of the Christians, and I remember one lady took me all the way around her yard and said, Pastor, not one twig broke anywhere near my house. Praise God. And please, I'm not saying we shouldn't praise God, but sometimes I suggest you go in your closet and praise God because across the street, four people were killed. Must be they just didn't know the Lord. Stop it, ignorant Christians, because who does God love? Everyone. I used to think at the second coming, Jesus, when he came, was going to have a smile on his face. But guess what? He loves everybody. What's he going to have on his face? I don't know. You explain to me the emotion of God. Scripture says there's joy in heaven over every sinner who repents. Scripture also says that God sees every sparrow fall. That means every deer that gets shot. That means every AIDS victim, cancer victim, divorce, abuse. Does God ever have a good day? And then we have the audacity. Oh, dear God, please help me find a parking space. I'm sorry. 
Maybe you've done that. <laughs> and God is interested in the little things too. Let me read the verse because it helps me. Thanks for listening. It's Luke 13. They came to Jesus with problems and issues and death and listen to what Jesus says. Luke 13, verse 1. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. In other words, he'd killed some Galileans. Jesus answered, I love this. Listen, Christians. Do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this way? Here's Jesus' answer. Look how Jesus deals with the problem of suffering. I tell you the truth. No, but unless you repent, you'll die too. Go on to the next one. Or Jesus, what about those 18 people who died? This sounds like a tornado. Who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were guilty, more guilty than others living in Jerusalem? And Jesus says, I tell you no. Unless you repent, You'll perish too. Jesus never even said, now this is the reason it happened. This person, he didn't do that. He just said, hey, let this be a sign to you to just give your life to God, give your life to God, give your life to God, and don't try to make sense of nonsense. And the final one, shortest verse you ever learned, we'll talk about it tomorrow. He goes to the tomb of Lazarus. The sisters are a little bit ticked off because Jesus didn't make it on time. And Jesus did what? Jesus wept. Please. I remember going to a funeral. We stood around the grave. The lady had died at a very young age of cancer, as some of your loved ones have. And the pastor was sincere but ignorant. We all take turns being sincere but ignorant. Please, don't be hard on ignorance. You are too. And here's what he said. God in his mercy took her. I poked Shelly. She gets poked a lot. Did you hear what I heard? <laughs> God in his mercy took her. I would suggest to you, I'll try not to shout, I will suggest to you that God doesn't take anyone. He weeps. And he says, one day, when we all leave this popsicle stand, I'll pay you back, like I said the other day, everything that's been ripped away. And please, remember what Jesus said. In this world, you will have trouble. I think I'm done. Oh, the Navy SEAL story. We got time for the Navy SEAL story. Get the book by Don Miller called Blue Light Jazz. Has nothing to do with jazz. Get the book. Here's the story he tells. I hope I tell it correctly. He had gone to a Christian concert. And when the Christian concert was ending, one of the guys who was singing started to preach. Maybe Christian concert guys shouldn't preach and singers shouldn't sing. I don't know. But anyway, he started to preach. And here's what he said. I had a buddy who was a Navy SEAL. And years ago, they were called up for a special assignment to go bring home some American hostages. Didn't go into details as to where. They went and did what you've seen on TV before. They, they modeled out where the hostages were and how they were going to do it and how they'd take the aircraft carrier and then the helicopter and land and get those hostages and bring them home. And they went through and did it so thoroughly with all the greatest minds working on any possible situations which would cause any problems with their, with their exercise to save these American hostages. And so the day came. The aircraft carrier was in place. The Navy SEALs got on the assigned helicopter and went to the dark place to get these American hostages. The helicopter landed without an event. The Navy SEALs got their night vision, got their guns, got their helmets, got all their stuff, and started running into the exact place as the model described where the hostages were. And they came running in. 
and everything was going beautifully. They found the hostages right where they were supposed to be. They were sitting on the floor in a fetal position. And the, the, the Navy SEAL says, hey, we're Americans. We're here to take you home. Come on, let's go. And nobody moved. They sat in their fetal position looking down at the floor. No one even looked up. No one had planned for this. No one had arranged this. What should we do now? No one had it. But I think in a divine moment, one Navy SEAL, catch the spiritual analogy, please. He took off his helmet. He laid down his gun. And he came down and took the position of the hostage so that his shoulder touched the hostage's shoulder, his elbow touched the hostage's elbow, and he looked just in the same posture as the hostage. And he just sat still for a second. And then he went like this. We're Americans. We're here to take you home. Will you follow us? And then he went like this. And then the hostage went like this. And the Navy SEAL got up slowly, and the hostage he was sitting next to got up slowly, and the next one, and the next one. And they went right out and took them to the helicopter, a power outside of themselves, to an aircraft carrier, to the place where they would greet their families. I won't insult your intelligence, but yes, I will. We're hostages. Philippians 2 says Jesus comes down to our level. But I already told you God is not a pushy God. He asks you one simple question. Don't complicate it, little earthlings. Don't complicate it, little Seventh-day Adventists. He asks you one question. Will you follow me? Heavenly Father, Thank you for your costly giving. As you came to rescue us, you lost your life. You thought you were forever separated from God. You are such a good God. We love you. Can't wait to see you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless. See you.